Hello, welcome to the USAID Asia Counter Trafficking in Person Summit from Evidence to Action, hosted by Windrock International. My name is Hermes, and I will be your technical facilitator today to ensure that you have a smooth experience with Zoom. You are at the session titled Rethinking and Reintegration. Before we get started, I just want to cover a few technical features available to you today. Today, we're using Zoom meetings to enable as much interactivity as possible. Your participation via chat is highly encouraged and our team will work to acknowledge and address as many comments and questions as we can throughout today's session. To help us acknowledge you and your questions and inputs, please rename yourself to your name and organization by clicking the participants button at the bottom of your screen, ho hovering your mouse over your name, clicking more and then rename. This meeting will be recorded today. Please keep your camera off unless you are invited to speak in order to help everyone have a smooth connection today. Continue the conversation in the conference community on MS Teams and spark further conversations on social media using the hashtags WinRockE2A and Evidence to Action. Once again, you are at the session titled Rethinking Reintegration. We are now ready to get started. I'm going to hand over the floor to Zain Mahmoud, Research Consultant at the Asia CTIP Project at WinRock International. Zain, the floor is yours. Thank you. Welcome everyone to this session on Rethinking Reintegration. Those of us who work in uh, countering trafficking in persons spend, uh, spend endless hours uh, thinking, discussing the barriers to successful reintegration. But how do we know what actually works in overcoming these barriers? How do we measure progress towards successful reintegration? And at a fundamental level, what constitutes successful reintegration? Does it mean different things to different people? Is there, is there a gender gap? Does it vary from country to country? Is it social rehabilitation? Is it economic inclusion? Is it uh, some, how do we make sure that survivors' voices are being included in our idea of what is successful reintegration? In order to uh, discuss this and much more, we have today a fantastic panel. We have with us Deepta Rakshit, who is team leader of the Ashash project. Uh, that is a project implemented by Windrock in Bangladesh, and it provides counseling, legal support, and economic empowerment support to survivors of uh, human trafficking. We have with us Akash Gautam, who is a scholar and researcher at Virginia Tech in the US. He has done extensive research on human trafficking survivors in Nepal. And last but not the least, we have Eric Casper, who is a senior researcher at the Institute of Development Studies in, at the University of Sussex in the UK. And Eric has been conducting research across Asia in various countries across Asia about what actually is successful reintegration. Uh, welcome to the panelists, and I really look forward to diving into the discussion. Eric, I would like to start with you. Um, does reintegration need rethinking? And based on your research, what actually is successful reintegration? Hi, Zen. Uh, thanks so much for that introduction. Um, so as Zen was saying, I have been working uh, with an excellent team from across Winrock um, for the last nine months or so. Um, well, I guess 12 months now. Um, researching what survivors themselves think constitutes reintegration. Um, so, I, you know, I'll start with the point that reintegration probably does need rethinking, that in some of the literature about reintegration and counter trafficking, um, you know, we do see that the term itself is a kind of technical jargon that survivors themselves don't really use or understand easily. So in, in our work, um, you know, people didn't really have a clear idea of what this term meant and it, it doesn't translate well across languages. Um, so I, I would just point out that in a lot of fields when things get uh, professionalized, there's a kind of technocratic creep, right? So people who do the work as professionals, whether it's researching or 
uh, social work, we start to think from our perspectives, right? And the, the term reintegration, it tends, you know, the, the term evolved in our field to emphasize the survivor, right? To, to think that it's not just about come back to some place or whatever happens to you, you know, but to say that this is a, a process kind of thing, right? So the term reintegration evolved as a positive development in our field, but it also tends to, in practice, get treated as if it's something that we do for survivors, right? The service providers do to survivors. We help them reintegrate. We reintegrate them. And I just would point out that we as practitioners need to try to counter that tendency um, of technocratic creep to keep the emphasis on survivors themselves and their agency. Um, so in our uh, research, we tried to speak with as many survivors as possible. And we had actually designed a whole uh, methodology around digital storytelling to give survivors a platform to tell their own story, to craft their narrative and, and allow that output to stand you know, in the world to help shape how people think about reintegration in the voice of survivors. Well, unfortunately, COVID uh, meant we had to um, put that on the shelf for now. Hopefully we do get to continue that eventually. But we, we did lots of interviews with survivors and their family members and their uh, neighbors to try to understand what, how they understood reintegration. And you know, in the terminology, we didn't really talk about reintegration. We talked about what they, what their hopes and dreams were, what their aspirations were, what we also might call well-being, but which doesn't really escape that jargon problem. Um, so, um, I mean, Zen, should I keep talking and show the uh, diagram now, or should I sort of wrap up there for now and, and make it more conversational? Sure. If you want to uh, share your screen and show the diagram, that would be great. I think it okay, would drive yeah, home what you're that. trying to say. Sure. Let me do that now. Thanks. <clears throat> okay, can you just confirm you can see this diagram now? We can see it. Okay, um, so before I talk through it, let me just uh, let me just add the link in the chat. So if you want, just click on this link at home and you can interact with this yourself in real time. Um, it is a draft and we're, we're still polishing it up, but we do think it stands as a, you know, a public statement of, of our research findings in a way, but to, to talk you through it. So here we have a, a blue circle in the middle, which is sort of uh, success, right? As defined by survivors and we can zoom in on that. Okay, so what we really learned from survivors and if you're a practitioner in this field, it, it may not be very much news to you, um, but still worth understanding that uh, the main points are survivors define success as basic survival and being with family or being in society with a kind of decent social standing. So here we have, you know, connection with the birth family. Um, in some cases, if people were a bit older and they had their own family, then it's their own family. Connecting with society, getting respect and acceptance from your peers, mental health, and then, um, because I've focused on this, what we're calling financial health, or basically, you know, um, earning a living through a livelihood. So these four things are what we really heard from survivors. Um, and if we think about reintegration from that way, then that can, I think, help us uh, frame our interventions a bit. So we do see a lot of interventions out there supporting survivors in terms of financial health. So helping them, uh, sorry, let me just zoom in on that one, um, helping them gain employment or generate income, um, you know, and then being able to have enough food to eat, 
so direct support for survivors this way and this, this is obviously a very good thing um, but what we learned is that sometimes it's not really feasible for a person to you know reintegrate into the place they came from right so survivors don't necessarily say that success is going back home right and in some places uh, it just doesn't make sense to train people in skills with the assumption that that will then lead to a livelihood if there is no livelihood option if the the area is you know declining if the population is moving on um, we can't assume that just giving people skills is going to help them earn a livelihood and we also need to be aware that many of these people uh, come from places where they didn't have access to literacy or, or basic education and so this tends to interact with our you know efforts to help them that you know they may not turn up to trainings um, and they may not explain why but it may be because they can't read and it's a bit shameful so they just disappear right um, so understanding as much as you can about those fine grain details about the survivors really helps to uh, craft your intervention <clears throat> and i think uh, you know another thing i want to point out is that reintegration is a systemic phenomenon so you know we talk about reintegration it's reintegration into what right it's a social system people reintegrate into uh you know social life political life economic life and it's about ties to everyone around them so all of these issues interact with each other as well right so um, I mean, in that way, it sort of demands a holistic approach. So not just one thing, but trying to support survivors and everything they're doing at once. And it, it means you can't have a cookie cutter approach to helping everyone in the same way. Because so if we look at what uh, society's, you know, respect and acceptance, that's going to be related to cultural norms and social norms and gender norms. So depending on uh, you know, that person's context where they're coming from, it could look like very different um, solutions. So, uh, you know, and this again comes back to the power of stories, for example. So if we, instead of emphasizing survivor or victim, right, if we emphasize overcomer. So if the, if the person who's come back from trafficking can make it known to their peers that actually they've overcome a great, you know, trial. They've had success in dealing with this great hardship that can sort of circumvent some other norms that might exist about, okay, you failed, you know, you tried to migrate, you didn't earn a living, so you failed. Um, so being aware of the systemic context about what norms are in place, what values, and how you can use certain values to circumvent the unhelpful ones. Um, that's a really important point. So let's just back out here again. Um, so let me leave it there for now. Uh, but basically our you know findings are are that you know if we pay attention to what survivors are saying, we get a deeper understanding of how people not only how they see reintegration, but how they see themselves as agents of change, as people capable of making a difference themselves. And then we can de design our ways of supporting them, you know, working with them rather than the tendency to work on their behalf. Um, so I'll just leave it there and, and hope we can pick this up again. Thanks, Eric. Uh, that's fascinating. Uh, there was a question from uh, uh, one of the members of the audience. Uh, if you could quickly explain your color scheme, that may not have been uh, clear to everyone. Oh yeah, there's a um, question. Sure, sure. Let me share the screen again. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. So basically, the uh, the yellow circles are the core um, elements that we heard from survivors about what constitutes reintegration. So financial health, mental health connection to family, connection to society. 
And then the gray circles are other factors. So for example, here we're suggesting that financial health impacts success via having enough to eat, via having a decent house, via resilient to resilience to financial shocks. So for example, you know, someone getting sick, a child getting sick can totally derail your effort to reintegrate um, unless you have sufficient, you know, cash at hand and also ability to earn. Um, and the green are, are areas where we think are promising areas to intervene. So for example, uh, related to finance, financial health is this issue of debt. We found that almost all the survivors and their community members were in debt. And this was something that both drove them into, you know, taking risks that led to them being trafficked and also um, things that something that limited their ability to heal and move on from the trafficking experience. So um, if we can intervene in that area to support people in getting out of debt or to limit kind of predatory microfinance, that would be really effective, I think, at support, in supporting people. And this red dot down here is the sort of bad outcome, the opposite of uh, success, which is, you know, uh, continuing suffering or not lack of healing and, and potential re-trafficking. And that's of course related to things like risks, uh, having to take excessive risks in order to get by or uh, just not being in control of the uh, conditions of your own life. So um, each of these circles, if you play around with them, they do have um, quotes and all from our research so you can get a sense of what they mean. And, and the, the arrows indicate, so the plus plus is, is that, so for example, more resilience to financial shocks leads to higher success um, or higher level of debt leads to, or put the other way, uh, lower levels of debt leads to higher financial health. Yeah. Thanks, Eric. Uh, I think that was a great point you made that as practitioners, we quite often try to define success for survivors, but um, as a matter of fact, we should uh, make survivors the focus of uh, successful reintegration and we should gauge their level of satisfaction and what they see as successful reintegration back into society. Thank you so much for that. Um, Akash, let me turn to you now. Uh, in your experience, what is the link between research and action? And um, uh, what do you think are the critical factors needed in order to support successful reintegration? Yeah, thank you, Jen, both for the introduction and the question. And uh, to begin with, like, I agree with what Eric said just now about like the systemic context and being aware of that when we when we go into the field and think about what success means for the survivors. And uh, in that context, like, I want to point out on the uh, thing that I've been, we've been exploring, which is regarding this notion of prefigurative justice. Uh, so what prefigurative justice means is that you embed in your methods the vision that you have for the survivors or for, for the future that you want in society, right? Like, and in this case, like Eric mentioned, we, we care about the survivors having agency, hearing their voices, uh, you know, and, and providing them with greater power once they move into society, which is what, uh, you know, been central in my work, which is like thinking about reintegration in terms of what the NG, what the my partner organization calls dignified reintegration. Now, dignified, as Eric highlighted, was is you know constitutes a lot of elements, including like economic well-being, but also agency to uh, engage with institutional resources and infrastructures available to them, and also uh, seeking out support as they require. Right, so. There's a lot of complex components at play here that we have to be aware of. And in, in that context, what seems to be critical is that, you know, given this is a long term, like it's multi-year, multi-pronged approach that's required for achieving successful reintegration. One of the things that we can begin and take action with is that we prefigure our methods to allow survivors to practice uh, having agency or practice accessing to uh, institutional resources within the methods itself. So that means like in smaller components, we create room for the survivors to 
you know, develop and practice their agency as they, as they move forward. And with those small moves, uh, it can constitute into larger effects later on. And I want to, uh, if I can, I'll share my screen with you all just to highlight what I mean by this through an example that I have in our research. Uh, just let me know if you can see the screen right now. Can we you can see it. All right, so just to highlight my, uh, my work, I'm in a PhD program in the US. I am from Nepal, so I'm familiar with some of the cultural norms and practices in Nepal, but still I am an outsider, right? So as an outsider, when I go in, there is, there's a lot of like uh, different uh, you know, organizational and cultural forces at play that I have to be cognizant about. And in my case, I've been working closely for the past four years with an anti-trafficking organization that, that begins with a position of care, like you know, the organization, itself has a lot of its programs that stem from uh, from its value around care and thinking really deeply about what it means for the survivors to be successfully reintegrated. Now, in that context, of course, there are other things like government regulations, as well as like multinational donor organizations such as Windrock, uh, who, who are part of this uh, ecosystem, right? And so, so when we go in, we generally have an agenda with us, like, you know, there's, there's, there's certain values or certain expectations that our programs would also ask of us to somehow operationalize in the field. And that sometimes gets reflected in the programs that are designed for the survivors, which not always center their voices, right? And so in, in, in my context, we, when I began the initial ethnographic study, this was four or five years ago, uh, what we saw was that there was a lot of work around in this is again like just to give you uh, the context this is just before reintegration when the survivors are in shelter homes uh, in what the NGO calls rehabilitation uh, the word is pro problematic and uh, we can get into like you know le discussions later on but uh, you know right now I'll use the word that the NGO uses, which is rehabilitation. And as part of the rehabilitation process, the NGO provides skills in uh, crafting, which is mostly on, around uh, local handicrafts that they can sell in the market. Uh, but it's not, not everybody is interested in the same skills like of creating crafting. So we kind of narrowed the scope of what the survivors can do. Having said that, there are certain strengths that they possess, right? Like they, they, they may be interested in some, some skills like dancing, singing, or as you can see in the bottom poster, they're interested in cutting photos and creating stories uh, of a few things that, you know, can raise awareness uh, or, or, you know, just share their day-to-day -day lives. So our methods can, in fact, build upon those strengths that the survivors have rather than on, on their needs to create something that allows them to foster their agency and develop a greater sense of self belief and confidence. So in, in my case, for example, in one of the research methods that I've done was because uh, the survivors were young and had worked with photos and seemed interested in, in working with photos, uh, I, I gave them a Polaroid camera to play around with. It's, it's, it's again, the emphasis was on playful activities and not on it being a task or a work. And so they, they took photos of their center homes, of their you know, dance classes, of, their, of them singing, of them eating, as well as some of the crafting work they've done. And so when we had them come together and discuss around those photos as a group, we heard nuanced voices that, were, that we wouldn't have heard had we simply gone in and asked them what they needed. Right. So here, the emphasis it was on the strengths that they have and trying to amplify those strengths using technology and using other means in our methods. So like, I'll, I'll try to like, I have other things to discuss as well, but for the time being, I'll, uh, I'll stop my presentation here uh, to again, draw in the point that we can constitute, like we can design our methods towards the embed and embed the vision that we have for the future within our method so that the survivors have a small room to experiment and uh, you know, develop the skills that we wish they have later on when they move out. And so in, in, in that context, again, this is not to undermine the problems that are in place, but if we begin from a position of strength, 
on our assets that they already have and try to highlight or amplify those strengths or assets, we may have a much more meaningful outcome later on, rather than you know if we focus on the needs and perpetuate that dependency based on the needs, right? So it's again, like the, in, in this context, I think like at least my research highlights the need for us to focus on strengths and amplifying those strengths. Thanks, Akash. Really, really interesting. And I think that's really important what you said about agency, uh, that um, we should not see survivors as passive victims, rather than we should try and empower them as agents of change. Uh, Eric, that made that point also. So uh, I, think, I think that is a really important takeaway for those of us active in this field. Um, um, Akash, there was a question from, uh, from Eugenio. Uh, a member of the audience say, asking, um, is it more about recovery rather than rehabilitation? Or do, the, uh, you know, do both of them go together? What do you think? It, yes, it is. It is about recovery. It is about, like, in, in, in the studies that we've done, what we find is that oftentimes it's, there's, there's a lot of, like, each, each individual survivor has a a different requirement, right? Like it is, some require a lot of, like Eric's works highlighted was a required mental health, like want mental health and require mental health support. Uh, others who want to uh, join the families require support, mediation support with the families. And it takes time in, you know, getting both the parties to uh, to come to a place of, uh, of togetherness, right? And uh, in other cases, it's often about uh, learning to, learning skills or learning, uh, developing the required, uh, you know, skills that can get them uh, towards financial stability. So it is, uh, it is about recovery. And in fact, like that space that's created usually within the shelter home can constitute, uh, can constitute this, you know, can constitute that space that provides them the opportunity to, to to meet their needs in the way that that they think is required for their future. So yes, uh, I think I think thinking of it as a, a, a space for recovery would be would be a better terminology than rehabilitation. Thank you. Uh, that's really really fascinating, uh, Deepta. I would like to turn to you now. Uh, you have um, extensive experience field experience in uh, designing and implementing uh, uh, programs uh, related to um, our reintegration. In your view, what is successful reintegration? And I'm, I'm, I'm particularly interested in, uh, you know, learning uh, your views on whether there is a gender difference, you know, whether there is a gender gap in this. Okay, thank you, Jane, uh, for giving me the opportunity. Actually, when I will say the successful integrations and the perspective from the gender, I will go later on. But based on my 15 years experience, I would like to share uh, some of my observations in this field. When I started working in the Serena before 15 years ago, interestingly, I came to know about different interpretations and definitions of the term integration at the field level. For instance, after getting rescued, when a survivor returns in the home country from the destination, they stay in a shelter home for a while. After that, naturally, they return to their homes. I have observed people considering the situation process as reintegration. Moreover, when they engaged survivors with income generation activities through some livelihood support, they put a level of successful integrations on it. Six months later, when I went to the field, I have witnessed a few issues. Some families, never accepted the survivors considering them a burden on the family. As a result, some survivors were literally kicked out from their homes. Some survivors were severely bullied by the community. They informed me that their neighbors or society showed disrespect and hated them, which had a significant impact even on their children. They, along with their families and children, were segregated from the society, facing discrimination and society imposed separation. And survivors who received some livelihood support could not actually continue with the income generation activities. Since the particular income generation activities did not meet their expectation and necessities. To my surprise, some were desperate to go abroad again, 
knowing the potential negative consequence well after having endured them in the past. And from there, I started my journey. What I am sharing today, this is not the expert opinion. I'm not the expert. I'm the practitioners. I'm working in the field. In my observation, including the pragmatic approaches and the failed ones that I learned through working at the field level. I hope you all are aware about the uh, trafficking perspective of Bangladesh, where a male survivor usually goes here repeatedly that you are good for nothing, like him has only a dark future after wasting at the family's money. On the other side, a female survivor must tolerate quite a different kind of acquisition. Society labels them as prostitute, kharap me, bad omen, blaming the, them for their past action. And community people keep saying that her life is over due to her dreadful sins. Considering this con context, we are considered regarding the integration process. Concentrate the integration process while well, planning case by case as a part of the participatory case management we consider actually three dimensional approaches for sustainable reintegration of the survivors. Those are the social well being, psychosocial well being, and economic well being. For social well being, we actually focus four entities family, survivors himself or herself, community, and the institutions. Firstly, as individual, we address survivors' vulnerability, their existence conditions, their access and mobility opportunity to be invited into social gathering, their identification by organizations, and their dignity as well as informing them that they are not rightfully excluded from society. And also we are sensitizing the community along with their families regarding human trafficking and disseminate the message that the cycle of the victimization includes not only the survivors, but also the families and society itself. For the second stage in case management, psychosocial well-being, we work with four groups, survivors, families, community, and service provider. We strongly prioritize survivors' mental health during counseling sessions to address trauma as well as to be able to prepare for future challenges. We also ensure mental health support based on the rehabilitative life skill because we have seen that uh, they already experience in the trafficking. So we are going to the life skill for the rehabilitative or the curative process, not the preventive process. As part of economic well-being, our message is that it's not only the improvement of livelihood, but development of the economic agency of survivors. We are uh, providing skills and entrepreneurship training, soft skill and the hard skills, linkage with the market and creating linkage with the financial institution. They will get the loan and other support from those institutions so that they can make informed financial decisions. However, now I am coming to your questions. There are some challenges, barriers at the implementation stage of this three-dimensional strategy. If we think about the gender aspects, we still see the traditional mindset among us. Still, we cannot think of encouraging female survivors to choose non-traditional female traits for economic empowerment. Still, when we are seeing that livelihood support for the women, we give them the sewing machine. We give them the cow, goat rearing. Here, I would like to actually say my current project, Asha, supported by Swiss Development and Corporations, SDC. How are we addressing this? We are actually demonstrating industry-based traits in front of survivors where they can choose uh, the traits for skill development. And simultaneously, we work with the industry also to create a decent work environment for them also. And we share survivors' expectation with their family, community, their husband, and in-laws to sensitize them for exploring support towards survivors. Because all you know, the social societal structure of Bangladesh, we are always gathering in the society, in the family. Women survivors being traumatized, for example, by forced prostitutions, face a significant level of discriminations due to the existing social stigma. They are often addressed as bad women in the society. And sometimes we have seen that Traffickers are strongly present in the community. Though we are say, saying that always prosecution is the best prevention, but sometimes it cannot happen because traffickers are more influential. They are the uh, government employees. Sometimes they are the big fish in the community. Other challenges are that there are a lot of service opportunity for women. 
though the quality of these options does not often meet the basic standard, but in fact, there are more opportunity for women than the male, male survivors. And males are often not considered as trafficking victims as well. We, we, are, we are saying that women are trafficked, men are migrated. So when women are coming, they are the victims of trafficking, but when males are coming in the same consequences, we are calling them the it's a return migrants. In working to ensure more successful integration, actually we have established a set of parameter to measure based on the experience and we, we actually did a baseline study also. So in this parameter, uh, we have actually see that what is the actually uh, parameter of the well-being. So as part of mental well-being, we choose a specific indicators that help explain a survivor psychosocial condition using a four-point Likert scale. Survivor respond to statements such as, I'm feeling optimistic about the future. I'm able to make up my own mind about things. Statement that gets to the social well-being. I am participating in social activity. I can easily talk with the other people. I regularly get invited to participate in community events. And economic well-being includes things like I'm engaging in income generation activities. I can spend my own money. I can contribute my children's education. I am able to make financial decisions. So some parameters we have set and based on these parameters we're working in the field but ultimately the final measure of successful integration i have to say survivors empowerment empowerment is realized when each of the three dimension social psychosocial and economic reaches sustainable threshold makers on all three dimension for example at least level four one the leakage scale for each the empowerment stage also requires that the survivor understand their rights and has agency to access mechanism for grievance, whether this be in the family, the community, or the access to justice sector. And in conclusions, I want to highlight that empowerment is the final measure of successful integration. And to achieve optimal results, integration strategy must use a multi-prolonged approach that is also tailor-made to address the need of each survivors. If I get chance, I'll say the why integration failed from my experience. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, Dipta. That was fascinating. Um, you said, I think we can all agree that empowerment is the final goal uh, for, uh, for reintegration. That is, a, uh, I think, a powerful statement. But I just wanted to ask, in terms of empowerment, uh, what is sustainability? What does sustainability look like? Uh, if you're implementing a project and um, you feel that uh, your beneficiaries have made progress towards empowerment. How do they sustain those gains once your project is over? Yes, I just shared one of the good examples in Bangladesh projects. It's a USAID supported projects, BCTIP. Actually, we have developed Survivor Voice on Irban group. They all are the experience of the trafficking, but they are the youth group. So when they are staying in the shelter home in the long term, I have seen that families did not accept them. Eight months, nine months later, one, one year later, their family did not come to receive them also. So from, from the, that point of view, we started digging to talk with them also, what they want. They want to organize themselves. Because in our country context, you know that it is very challenging because our survivors, one before five, six hours, Years ago, our survivors never come to give the statement that I'm the victims of trafficking. So day by day, we have worked with them. We have uh, developed their leaderships. We have actually uh, uh, give them some opportunity to raise their voice also. We have included them in the theater, in the dance therapy. Akash already told some of that therapy also. And we have given them the lot of counseling where they will not see the past, they will see the challenges of the future. So Onirban Survivor Force now is the established organizations in Bangladesh. They are working for the community, by the community, and with the community. They are working for the survivors, by the survivors, with the survivors also. So they have developed themselves as a resource persons on behalf of survivors. They are talking, negotiating with the duty bearers, different ministry also. And I would like to say that this is the Onirban who made the possible we, Bangladesh, got the new law of the anti-trafficking. 
before 2012 we had we had no law to accuse the uh, traffickers we, uh, we 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 did not get it because recruiting agency pressures to the government not to actually sign of this human trafficking law so recruiting agencies business will be hampered but this is the only one who raised the voice in front of the ministry in front of the law ministry and they shared their experience that why prosecution is the important to prevent trafficking and to protect survivors and after that we got the law so this is the very good example and living examples of the survivors empowerment thank you Deepta. um fascinating uh, eric i'd like to come back to you um you um spoke powerfully about uh, agency um I, I just wanted to um uh, ask you to elaborate on that a little bit more um you've uh, in the reintegration research that you have done in various countries including in bangladesh and in bangladesh i know that you drew on the uh, uh the perceptions and the experience of the onirban group as well uh that people just mentioned uh but um based on the overall research that you've been doing in uh, uh south asia and southeast asia do you think that survivors often see themselves as agents of change uh what did you find in your research thanks yeah that's a great a great question um i mean agency is not all or nothing right people agency is the extent to which people feel like they make a difference in their actions right so you know people experience various levels of agency so to some extent yeah everyone we spoke to had some level um but yeah it can be a big problem and and obviously the same um you know, all those systemic factors they intersect and and um you know layer on top of each other so someone who's got an ongoing trauma and a mental health struggle is not going to feel like they can do much, right? So maybe they feel like they need to stay in the house for a while. Um, but eventually, you know, the idea is, you know, as, as Deepta was saying, if we get to the point of empowerment, but that strengthens agency. Empowerment and agency are very similar, I guess. It's, you know, those of us who uh, theorize that we sort of find nuances around these things but ultimately I mean in practice it's very similar um, <clears throat> I, I think the honor bond groups are a really great example of that agency um, the, the sort of self-organized self, self uh, care um, approach which I mean we, we see poor people's groups organizing in neighborhoods across the world um, you know, I think in Bangladesh and, and for sure in India, you have slum dwellers federations that work on the same principle of, you know, together we can build the power to, you know, make the world more like what we want it to be. So I, I think that's a really great example of, of agency. And obviously it's, you know, the more we can work with them in their organizations, the better. Um, but for example, there's a, a story that's stuck with me from our, um, interviews in, in um, Cambodia, we, inter we interviewed one uh, social worker who told us a story about a man who had come to them as a trafficking survivor. He had, he had been on a fishing boat for several years and something had gone wrong and uh, you know the, the fishing boat captain had basically thrown him into the sea and left him to die. Um, so you know, perhaps that man was just a migrant who then like that experience of migration went badly and it became trafficking or it could have been trafficking the entire time. But the point is that he came back, he was a survivor of trafficking and the NGO was uh, trying to help him. And basically he said very firmly, you know, if, if I'm going to stay here, I need a piece of land and, and a few, uh, you know, pigs and animals and they said, well, you know, we just don't have the money. We don't have the resources to give you that. It's a bit unreasonable to ask for all of that. Like you're a trafficking survivor. You should be grateful to be alive and grateful that you have anything from us, right? But this guy he knew that, uh, you know, he'd been abroad. He knew that he could get a better deal somewhere else, right? And so he, was, he said, okay, I'll, I'll go. And he migrated back to Thailand. And they later heard that he had gotten a, a decent job as a, a security guard or something 
So, I mean, when they told us the story, it was like, this is a confounding thing that sometimes survivors, they don't accept our help. Uh, and for them, this was clearly like not a successful reintegration, right? But from his perspective, that was what success looked like. It wasn't sticking around. It was going back again and trying again and finding, you know, a better, a better way. So I think not seeing that as a, as a confounding situation, you know, that, that situation must have made good sense to him, but it didn't make sense to the, the social workers that were telling us. So, um, you know, I think that's, that's something what it looks like to value the agency of the survivor. You know, sometimes reintegration success doesn't mean staying around. It doesn't mean following the path we expect them to follow, right? So. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Eric. Akash, um, I just wanted to ask you what you thought of uh, the points that Deepta raised. And um, I also wanted to ask you to discuss um, some of the, the more innovative approaches that you are seeing come out of uh, contemporary research in this field. Yes, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, I, was, I was agreeing with Deepta's point about like, you know, that reintegration like empowerment constitutes elements around like social, psychosocial and economic well-being. And just the fact that they can access mechanism for grievances what, when Dipta said that was something very powerful, right? Like the ability to see, like express grievances even against their own families or other problems is, is a sign of agency, right? And so that, that's, that's the goal that we have in our mind. But as Eric said, success or the outcome that should be there should be on the survivor's terms and sometimes the path they take may not align with the with the with the thing that we have in our own mind uh so that that i completely agree with dipta's point of, on on that uh what my research uh, highlights is is a more like nuanced perspective on how to get there like so again uh I, if, if you don't mind i'll share the screen and i'll talk about one of the work that I've, I've done in Nepal. So just to give a background, I'm a computer scientist. So I design and develop web app, like computer technologies, including web applications. And in, 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 in our studies, what we've been doing is we've been incrementally building upon some of the findings that we've, uh, you know, some of the findings to design and develop web applications, technologies, so that it provides a broader perspective on possibilities moving forward. So as Deepta also highlighted, uh, so, some of the things that are presented to the survivors in, in my context in, in, in the shelter homes are very limited. So here, most of the anti-trafficking organizations in Nepal work on, provide training on crafting, but crafting, you can do only so much of crafting, right? There's limited market within Nepal on selling the handicraft. So, the, the possibilities of it being sustainable towards the long-term livelihood is not, is bleak. And so what we've been doing is we've been trying to identify their strengths and build upon those strengths. And there was a question about that on how we've been doing it in our work. And I, I'll just talk through this. Uh, so in, in the earlier work, what we found was that the survivors had ambivalent values around crafting. First, they found crafting to be therapeutic and to be of value in, in sharing with one another in the shelter home. But at the same time, they were worried that their crafts would not sell in the market. And that seen that the NGO was struggling to sell those crafts in the local market. Uh, we also found that you know, because most of the survivors are young, uh, uh, they, they wanted a playful experience of you know, uh, music and dance. Uh, were central to, to their idea about what a happy or a good life looks like. And so what we did was like, we, we started exploring whether these strengths, the crafting skills, as well as the playful mutual bond that they had could be built upon towards a step that broadens their perspective moving forward. And in our work, I'll just share this. Uh, one of the things that I did was I designed a, a set of, uh, features in a web application that was contextualized around crafting. So it, it, was, it was presented as a way for them to talk about their crafts and also post it online to sell it to potential buyers outside of the Nepali market, right? But the goal here was not on them to sell the crafts or not for them to 
you know, to become long-term sellers of the crafts, but rather see and support them to develop digital literacy, like ability to use computers, ability to access internet and, uh, you know, information that comes with it and to know how to do that. Like, you know, how, how do I find out what documents are required to get a bank loan or how do I find out where the nearest hospital is or how do I get a loan if there is a family emergency, health emergency and I, I need a large sum of money. So what we did was we presented we designed a web application that again uh, did not look on their needs but rather looked at the strengths that they had so because we identified crafting as what crafting as a skill that was a, their strength and the playfulness part was uh, their strength we we built those in the in the application that we designed by focusing on drawings on on recording music or recording videos on 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 sharing with one another and leaving audio comments. And another example that I can highlight here is many of the survivors could not read. They, they had very limited uh, experience on using computers or mobile phones. So rather than saying that, you know, let's first develop your digital literacy skills, what we did was we, we embedded naturalistic voice annotations. So the web application, if they move around, spoke in a familiar language, in, in this case in Nepali, in a female's voice saying what those components did. So for example, when they were to move around in the login button, it would say to go inside this technology press here. So these small reconfiguration in the way we present our approach helps. So what we did was we had a workshop with a group of survivors where they worked in groups in, in in accessing the web application uh, the, that I designed and built upon it towards using internet and uh, and mostly Google search and Wikipedia uh, slowly. And then uh, with that, what we found was that uh, they were able to use the uh, the computers to access resources or access to a, to a limited extent, but access the things that they were interested in. So we, we saw them, you know, in some cases watching Cinderella or or uh, some music videos, Nepali music videos, but at the same time also going to Google searches to look at uh, their hometowns where they had not been for years. And so, you know, there's, there's meaningful value in that playful experiences that are provided for them that can constitute into broader possibilities moving forward. So uh, one of the examples that I want to share from my study was that at the end of these uh, sessions, after the second session, which was like a typical session is around 10 days of workshop. So at the end of the, the 20 days of workshop, one of the survivors said, I think I can, you know, I can be an office worker. So what that meant was like, she started because of the computing abilities, she thought that the possibility to work as an assistant in office can happen. And that broadening possibilities by slowly building upon their strengths can help in the long run. Uh, here again, to emphasize, uh, we're not again overlooking the problems that are in place. There are systemic issues, uh, finding you know organizational organizations that can hire and provide the support required for the survivors is a challenge and remains a challenge, and that, that has to happen in parallel. But we do need, uh, we can begin from a position of strength while working with the survivors so that each of our incremental steps can add and further uh, foster, uh, foster their agency. So, yeah. Fascinating, thanks Akash. Uh, we are running short of time, but I have uh, two quick questions, one each for Dipta and Eric. Uh, Dipta, we have been talking about the satisfaction levels of uh, survivors uh, when it comes to successful reintegration. How important is it for survivors to have the satisfaction or get the closure of knowing that the people responsible for their traffic, uh, trafficking experience have been prosecuted and been held accountable. Yeah, it's a actually project to project verify, program to program verify. Here I would like to say the survivors will be satisfied uh, then when you will consider it's not a project activities, it's a program. It's a long-term program approach for the survivors. We are talking about the uh, social well-being, psychosocial well-being, and the economic well-being. It's not the actually six-month or the four-month jobs. It's like 
long term process also if we consider the survivors where they are in the community in the shelter home or in the uh, independent places we have to consider them their variety uh, of needs and the expectations also based on their skills based on their capacity and based on their context also most of the times we have seen that uh, uh, we are very limited in our options our project consider this, 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 these things, we offer them to them. So there, we actually stop them from the very beginning of the process because there is a no other yes. options in my hand also. So yes. most of the time, integrations are failed. Sometimes integration are failed. Sorry to cut you off. I, I would because... like to say in, the, in my last word that when we are saying that survivor-centered approach, this means not only the individual of the survivors, we should consider their family, their community, as well as the institution where they will get the service also. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Eric, very quickly, um, interesting question from Sarah, that uh, most NGOs working on reintegration do not offer re-migration as a solution. Um, what do you have to say to that? How important is that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think in our study, the kinds of trafficking we really looked at, the, the survivors that we talked to were ones who had, had migrated on the idea of, of working somewhere and then just got trafficked. Um, so for these kinds of people, which are a vast number of people, and as Deepta was saying, men who, who follow this path don't often get noticed as trafficking survivors, um, then helping with re-migration or helping make migration safer is a, a massive uh, area where we could make a huge difference. Even if, you know, often we saw it just comes down to they didn't have the right documents and the cost of getting the right document was prohibitive, so they took this risk. Um, or, you know, rather than go next week, it's like go in six months and that's too long to wait to start earning money. So people take the risk. So what, whatever little ways we can make that process safer is, is great. But of course, you know, everything is complicated and, and there are reasons why NGOs don't focus on that, including, you know, the fact that that could be a politically contentious issue, a cross-border politics issue, an international relations issue. So they may feel very limited to, to take some of these steps. Um, but yeah, I mean, for me, the, the big thing is, you know, what Deepta was saying, like why I was shaking, why I was nodding in agreement is just that it, it's, all, it's all interrelated and it's all so complicated. And, it, you know, when, when we talk about our agency, what we can do, it's really that, that relational thing of building connections with the people we can and doing what we can Indeed. and trying Thank slowly, you. slowly to change that system. Thanks, Eric. Fascinating points raised by everyone. We could continue this discussion for hours, but we have to close. Um, thank you, uh, Eric Kasper. Thank you, Akash Gautam. Thank you, Deepta Rakshit. Um, very important takeaways from this discussion. Uh, we have to place survivors at the center of reintegration efforts. We cannot, as uh, practitioners and researchers, define reintegration or successful reintegration for them. We have to listen. We have to give survivors voice and agency. Thank you to our panelists and thank you to the audience and all participants. Thank you. Thank I will you. turn it over to Hermes now for the, we are staying in this room for the final session, right Hermes? So I will turn it over to you. Thanks. That is correct. Thank you everyone so much for your attention and attending this session. Um, we are going to go ahead and transition directly into our final session as we get our panelists queued up here. Um, we'll be celebrating all of the learnings that all of you have had throughout this week. It's been a wonderful week full of different sessions with people from around the world. And we are in such gratitude for everyone's participation throughout this week. It's been really, really wonderful. Um, as we get ready here for the final session, um, I just want to remind you that we do have a pitch competition that is open to all registrants of this summit. There is a 50,000 US dollar um, pool of money for up to three projects. And you can find out more information about this pitch competition on the website or on the conference community on MS Teams. Proposals featuring new partnerships at the summit are prioritized and applications will be due at the end of the month. Um, and we really, really hope that you can connect with potential collaborators on the conference community on MS Teams. 
So do do take a look at that and and find collaborators for this grant competition. Um, I'm going to go ahead and relieve our um, our interpreters now. So so we will uh, go ahead and let you go. Thank you so much for your assistance today and throughout the rest of the summit. And I think that we are ready to get started with main key takeaways and next steps with Winrock International and USAID. So I'm going to hand the floor now to Sarah J. Keel, Senior Director of Winrock International's Human Rights, Education and Empowerment Group. Sarah, the floor is yours. Thank you, Hermes. Uh, first, we just sincerely appreciate your and AM's support and the whole team at Insight Pact uh, for helping move us through the last few PACT days so smoothly. Um, we're sincerely appreciative. Good morning and good evening to everybody for joining. Thanks for joining our closing panel. Um, we have nearly reached the end of the Evidence to Action Summit. And before I turn to our takeaways and our incredible panel from USAID, I just wanted to share my gratitude for the Asia CTIP team um, and for every panelist, facilitator, practitioner, researcher, NGO, technologist, policymaker, everybody that joined us, including local USAID staff from Pakistan, Nepal, Bangladesh, Thailand. You know, I think connecting with people, seeing your faces, hearing your voices during these, you know, somewhat uncertain times has really, I think, buoyed my spirit. And the quality and the caliber of the discussions has been inspiring. I think we appreciate every one of you who's attended and contributed such thoughtful questions and honestly spurred some real debate. Um, so before I turn to the panel, I just wanted to share a few reflections on, on the time that we've spent together, which has been considerable. We have spent uh, three days together, 14 hours a day uh, for 20 sessions, and we had over 623 attendees, 75 panelists and moderators, and that was across 21 time zones and seven languages. So we really have tried to make this as inclusive as possible for everybody that's joining. The sessions touched on so many important topics, reintegration, victim identification, social behavior change communications, prosecution, you know, looking at forced labor and supply chains, technology, assessing vulnerability. And I think we were able to provide, you know, from the panelists and participants, a lot of insights, a lot of ideas, and we've been able to forge some new partnerships, which we can already see from the collaboration around uh, the pitch challenge that Hermes mentioned, and we'll mention it again at the end. We also had two really fruitful sessions on barriers to evidence uptake. Um, the first geared towards uh, civil society organizations and then barriers to dissemination, really geared towards academics, you know, the UN, INGOs, and I think we produced you know, a lot of recommendations uh, and ways forward, and we will certainly share those. We'll condense them and share that widely. But I think we feel you know, incredibly proud of the diversity, the inclusion, the participation. I think what was unusual about this event and what we at USAID Asia CTIP and Winrock you know, recognize and wanted to achieve is people from different backgrounds coming together in the same space. So having academics from California and frontline civil society folks from Vietnam, you know, UN officials from regional hubs, consultants that have worked on the TIP report and represented the US government. You know, we've had a wide range of people coming together and I think that's what's really created, you know, the space for interesting conversation. All of us, you know, work to bring to light trafficking in persons, but it can be hard to take the time to learn about different perspectives on the same issue. And we hope that, you know, this summit has provided a platform for a lot of voices and provided an included, inclusive environment where people felt confident and welcome to share those experiences. So there's been sort of three main themes that we've thought through over the course of the last three days that we noticed every panel, every working session, every fireside chat was touching on these. And those are collaboration, voices, and understanding. So on the topic of collaboration, I think, you know, this was brought up again and again. Uh, Genevieve Taft Vasquez, the Global Director for Workplace Accountability at the Coca-Cola Company, told us that they've been able to make real progress due to Oxfam's critical engagement and mentioning that, you know, we should listen to our critical friends so that we can see and respond to issues better. The concept of voices was also a really welcomed theme throughout the summit. 
presenters brought up this again and again. For example, Sally Ye, a fellow in the Department of Social Inquiry at La Trobe University in Australia, reminded us that victims' voices have to be central to examining the gaps in our response. These are the voices that should be dictating our intervention. And lastly, the concept of understanding is also really closely related to voices. You know, if we don't strive to understand all different aspects of this complex problem, you know, we can inadvertently do harm. And that is, you know, the last thing any of us want to do. As Moni Lim from Ad Hoc in Cambodia, who was on our opening panel, you know, very poignantly mentioned, she said, we must remain close to those in need. We cannot simply make assumptions or think that we know their physical and emotional needs. So I think that connectivity to survivors and the people we serve um, has been, you know, in the forefront for this panel. So I'm going to turn it over uh, briefly to Jenny Sorensen, uh, WinRock's Director of the Human Trafficking and Migration Team, to share a couple of critical takeaways, and then we will turn to the panel. Jenny. Hi, everyone. Yep. Hi, everyone. Um, so we just wanted to share some of the key takeaways in addition to the themes. So, um, you know, the working group sessions and the panels and fireside chats produced excellent, you know, takeaways for researchers, the private sector and CSOs. So the first one, as you heard in the last session, is that the cost of not implementing findings from good research is really borne by survivors. So if we do research and then choose not to implement it or are unable to implement it for some reason, then INGOs, the UN and academics will not suffer the consequences, but survivors will. So they're the ones not getting the correct interventions and services. Um, another key, find, key takeaway is that research is not always accessible. This came up several times. Um, findings can be kept behind a paywall or recommendations might be off the mark or too general. Um, we really need to work together to make sure that the findings are public, they're feasible and applicable. Um, and I would um, also say um, realistic. Um, and academics need to use language that is easily accessible by practitioners and the um, implementation community. Uh, there's no silver bullet, we'd like to say at this point in time after you know 20 plus years working on counter trafficking and modern slavery efforts that there is, but there is not. So technology or specific one off interventions are not the answer. Um, we need to remember to work holistically and collaboratively and be open to taking criticism and readjusting our programs um, and research. Uh, we do know that research is time consuming and it's challenging and it's expensive. That's something that comes up a lot, um, but it's needed and we just need to keep prioritizing it. Uh, it does need to be planned with responses in mind from the beginning. So we need to be engaging governments and local and international NGOs early on to make sure that they know about the research, that, they, um, that the research questions are relevant to them and that they're ready to implement the recommendations. So we need to plan for impact from the very beginning. And finally, it's okay to rethink how we're framing and thinking about what trafficking modern slavery are and how we should approach them. In fact, we probably should be thinking about that. Um, we've been working under the same framework for a while and it's, it's probably time to test that and, and kind of kick the tires. Um, so some participants suggested that maybe we need to reconsider this framework we are using to define and respond to trafficking. But thanks, I'm gonna turn it back now to Sarah so she can engage our panelists. Thanks, Jenny. So to close out the summit, we wanted to create a space to hear from USAID on their priorities, their reflections, um, and their ideas for how we can successfully translate evidence into action. So please feel free to ask questions in the chat and we will field them throughout. Um, we're incredibly lucky to have four colleagues from USA joining us and I'll introduce them and then I'll turn to each of them to provide you know, a more robust introduction of their role, their background, their experience, and and. Uh, jump into some of our questions. So our first panelist is Mary Vihill. She is the agency CTIP lead and senior advisor on counter trafficking at USAID. The next panelist is Tina Flora Changam, who is a project management specialist with RDMA in Bangkok, who also oversees the Asia CTIP program. Uh, our third panelist is Brent Wells, who is a senior research advisor at USAID's Global Development Lab in Washington. And last is Casey Mixon, who is an American Association for the Advancement of Science Research Fellow uh, at USAID at the DRG office. And she's focused on counter trafficking efforts and also brings a really unique perspective. So we're incredibly grateful to have you. Um, if you could start, and I'll start with Mary, um, by introducing yourself, your role, and sharing some just initial remarks around 
um, you know, uh, the research in the context of CTIP programming and any comments that you have on, on research priorities, you know, potential perceived gaps or experience that you wanted to share from USAID's perspective. I'll turn it over to Mary. Great, thank you, Sarah. Um, good morning and good evening to everyone. Um, it's a pleasure for us to be here and to join you all um, for this evidence summit. Um, so my name, as uh, Sarah mentioned, is Mary V. Hill. Um, I'm the agency um, CTIP lead, um, which basically means that my role is to um, implement the CTIP policy um, across the agency, um, develop strategies, develop vision um, for how we approach counter trafficking at the agency, and then um, you know, and then of course helping to find duties, roles, and responsibilities across the agency in order to implement. Um, these strategies and um, policy. And with that, um, I work out of the DRG Center at USAID, which is the Democracy, Human Rights and Governance Center um, based in Washington, DC. And I do work with the team out of the DRG Center, um, as well as work with our extended team members in each of the regional bureaus and also in the missions, um, as well as other pillar bureaus like the Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance, for example, and of course, Global Health and, and other bureaus. Um, and so with that, um, what we do um, at USAID um, in, in terms of addressing trafficking is we work with the interagency. There's a huge U.S. government-wide effort. Um, it might be one of the, actually the, the, one of the largest um, coordinated efforts that we have in the U.S. government because of the priority that counter-trafficking has taken. Um, and so that means there's a lot of meetings that we hold um, together with other agencies and departments. Um, like Department of Labor, Department of Justice, Department of State, um, Department of Homeland Security, um, et cetera. And so we have these very coordinated meetings that we hold um, to discuss these various issues, to coordinate on policy, to coordinate on reporting, um, and to coordinate on grants, and, um, and you know, to discuss strategy, and to also just coordinate more in the field, um, and in terms of working with embassies and, and working with our implementing partners um, to address these various issues with the government and with also local civil society organizations. Um, we also provide field support and, um, and other, as I mentioned, that's very similar to field support and of course advocate for the various needs to make sure we can continue to do what we're doing and to continuously grow and improve, um, particularly keeping up with innovations and just new findings. Um, which is very relevant to what we're doing now with um, particularly what we're doing at the Evidence Summit is looking at ways in which research can better inform programming, um, ways in which innovations can also help us develop better methods and tools to combat trafficking. Um, and so, you know, so, so when we look at research um, and how that can affect what we're doing for USA, that's really looking at it from a learning evaluation and research perspective. And so that means, um, you know, so we have some funding that comes from Washington in which we um, provide this, this funding to our contractors that then go out and do the research that's specific to the needs of the missions. And so, um, and this is where this becomes a bit unique um, because at USAID, we are um, a decentralized organization. And so we heavily depend on the expertise um, of our local missions, um, working with our partner foreign governments and that relationship and, and their relationship with civil society organizations and other implementing partners and with just the community and the survivors becomes very critical to combat trafficking. And so they're the experts in knowing or in, in identifying what the needs are so that we can then, you know, then they come back to us to, um, to then work with us where we can brainstorm ideas on how we might develop various research um, to address their needs. And it could be anything from, um, exploring and, and just assessing what are the re what are the counter trafficking or the trafficking issues to that local area, right? So it could be something very very basic as that, um, which often is very critical and important, um, so that we can then develop programming that is tailored to the local geographic area and ecosystem, right? So that again that becomes again very important because although we want to develop best practices and, and find ways in which we can scale approaches. The reality is, is that each of the areas we work in is very unique and has its own trafficking issues. That is, that is although we might be able to generalize and say that um, this is a, a trafficking issue affecting um, 
children in orphanages or migrants, et cetera, the reality is that it's very specific to the geographic area. So that be, that's very important for us um, in terms of how we develop programming. Um, so having said that, when we look at, um, you know, so what are some perceived gaps? What are some priorities for us? Um, you know, number one is we want to address our research priorities or to address the needs of the missions. That's number one. Um, number two, when we work with them, we also look at, um, you know, what are some innovative ways that we might be able to explore in a particular area to combat trafficking um, and inform programming? Um, number two is looking at um, demand reduction, right? And so we actually just had the release of the United States National Action Plan to combat human trafficking. And in that National Action Plan that was just released last month, um, there are very specific items um, that we are called to look at, which sure won't become a surprise for many of you on the call right now. Um, and that includes, as I mentioned, demand reduction. Um, you know, I know that's a very important, you know, term in our field and looking at how can we, given a certain area and in general, look at ways in which we can reduce that for a local area, whether that's working with private sectors or whether that's doing social and behavioral change. Um, but yeah, and, and then again, tailoring that to the local environment. So Demand reduction is huge in our interagency efforts as well. Um, as I said, also the National Action Plan. Second is also identifying, um, you know, part of this, part of these efforts is to actually identify research gaps to better serve the vulnerable and marginalized populations of a given area, right? As we know, that is very specific to an area. In some areas it might be, um, you know, again, children of certain ethnic uh, minority backgrounds, uh, or ones in refugee camps, or in other areas, it could be um, it could be migrants, um, you know, et cetera. So, again, looking at specific ways according to the local environment, um, and then the other one is to you know solicit research to identify um, effective interventions again to combat labor trafficking, and so this you know also becomes very important. Um, again, it could be through working with private sectors, or it could also it could also be again combined with innovative ways um, in which we can help educate and provide um, resources, um, referral networks, et cetera, for people who are um, victims of labor trafficking. But again, the door is wide open, and USAID welcomes opportunities to look at innovations for research. Um, this, you know, is something that we're very much prioritized because we're always looking for ways in which we can improve and, um, and, and to eliminate trafficking. And so with that, I'll go ahead and yield over to my other colleagues. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Um, really appreciate some of the focus there around just, you know, localized and tailored solutions. And you, you know, very explicitly mentioned that the needs of, you know, individual missions are are dependent on that local context, um, and to really think about research gaps that are addressing critical needs on the ground for specific unique populations. So I will turn it to uh, Tina, who is coming from, you know, a specific mission perspective, a regional mission perspective, to see what she'd like to share. Tina. Yes. Thank you, Sarah. So um, from, from a mission perspective, I think it's a very similar even from um, this aspect that we're looking at research and evidence base to be able to help us, you know, make informed decision for programming for the design of the activities, especially if we're, uh, for example, I'm based out of um, regional development of Asia, which is in Bangkok, we're covering a large geographical uh, coverage, which we need to be better understand what are the linkages between each countries, the cross boundaries issues and also cross countries that we need to address. So evidence and studies and research will, able, will be able to help us identify all of those gaps and also to be able to better connect, you know, people and making uh, better collaboration because um, we have done some research in this area and some, uh, sorry, I mean, consultations just recently because I've just joined this team just a few months ago. I was previously uh, working on a different portfolio and to better understand and for myself, for our newcomers is to be able to understand what are the areas of things that we could look at and then in order to do that, we need to utilize research, the studies, what I've 
what others are able to inform us. And the best way to do this is to speak with the people in the country, the beneficiaries themselves, and the people, the frontline um, people who are working in this area. And that's how we are able to get more information, tailor our programming and our approach to be able to connect the dots and better address uh, what we would like to work on. And of course, it's uh, co combating trafficking. It's a huge um, aspect. It's a global um, you know, um, issue that could would not go away in a single year. It would probably take a few, I don't know, like a pretty much long time and it has been ongoing forever. Uh, but ideally, like even with like right now, COVID has exacerbated and, you know, exposed them more vulnerable to be more vulnerable in their area. So uh, by having research and having informed, um, you know, studies to be able to fill us the gap, tailor our approach, what are the basic needs that's needed to be able to help the most vulnerable and most in needs to be able to, you know, make informed decision, at least from their self to be able to do better protections for the community. And that's that's something I think it's very valuable, especially in this time where, you know, mobility is really restricted. You know, we have limited access to provide services. People who are more vulnerable will be more exposed to their vulnerability. And these are the, all the information that we could provide is like, here are some access to information to be able to protect yourself and, you know, other things we need to look at. And also, like, we need to understand that te with technology and innovation, everything is, you know, rapidly changing, um, you know, traffickers are utilizing technology to be able to access, you know, um, people are, and recruit them in the most, like, you know, in the, uh, I wouldn't say it's a creative, but it's the way that we're not imagining. So we need to be able to inform and adapt our approach to be able to, you know, understand and how to tackle those through, you know, whatever uh, studies is informing us, what kind of technology is available, what are the youth using to be able to access those information and how to reach the beneficiary for themselves to be well informed. So um, that's from my end. Thank you. Thank you, Tina. I really appreciate those those comments. I think, you know, you highlighted some of the same components is Mary around being localized and being tailored, but also really stress the idea that we have to be in communication with beneficiaries directly to really understand, you know, sort of what those critical needs are. You also mentioned, um, you know, just uh, the overlay of COVID and what that means for enhanced vulnerabilities and increasingly restricted mobility and how it's, you know, affecting migration patterns. So it's a topic we can try to touch on throughout this if there's specific ideas around, COVID related research or, you know, sort of ways to tap into that. Obviously, it has to be fairly rapid fire and rapid response um, in order for us to be able to to implement. So maybe that's something the pitch challenge uh, teams are, are potentially considering in the ideas. Um, and also the mention of technology that that's what's being used to recruit and it's, you know, as we all well know, online exploitation has been significant and it's only increasing in the context of COVID. So how are we quickly pivoting and understanding and addressing um, via, you know, action focused research what's happening there. I will uh, turn it over now to Brent Wells. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Sarah. So as, as Sarah said, my name is Brent Wells. I am in the Center for Development Research within the Global Development Lab at USAID. So the Center for Development Research is uh, designed to promote the, the use of scientific research and the uptake of evidence in order to solve development challenges uh, worldwide. So in that sense, we're, we're a little bit unique at USAID because uh, not only do we work across all regions, but we also work across all disciplines and sectors of, of research. And um, uh, you know, I think that's important uh, when, when trying to understand the best ways to um, build commitment upon amongst government and, um, and uh, donors to use research, but also amongst stakeholders to uh, take up that evidence and apply it to, to what they're doing. So, uh, you know, the, we spend a lot of our time thinking about ways to, to improve the commitment, as I said, amongst donors and to sort of plug them into the research projects 
as we are uh, kicking them off so that there is, there is that commitment in, in order to use the evidence that's been created. And we also work a lot with researchers on ways to improve the way they are disseminating uh, their research and communicating with uh, different stakeholders. Uh, as we know, everything is context dependent, everything is audience dependent, and in order to get uh, good uptake, it, it really takes a, a good understanding of who you're talking to and the best way that you can, you can grab their attention. Now, as Mary said, a lot of the work that we do, actually all of the work that we do is, uh, needs to be um, uh, aligned with our uh, mission, uh, our country mission priorities. And so uh, we, in some ways we are uh, very much a client services uh, office because um, uh, the missions will, will come to us and tell us that they need a, a certain uh, piece of evidence or they need some research conducted. And then we uh, come in with uh, researchers in order to do that. Now we get that done not only through our implementers, but also through funding local researchers directly. Uh, so, so we will actually um, hire on and fund researchers from uh, the developing countries to, to work on projects that are of uh, interest to them and where they have specialties in. And you know that, that's also important because the USAID mission, of course, they have uh, a strong understanding of the development challenges in the country, but the local researchers, um, you know, they live it every day, those challenges and sometimes bring even, even more insight and also passion to the work that they're doing because it really does uh, improve the livelihoods of themselves and their neighbors. And it also builds the capacity of those uh, partners uh, to, be, to be better partners in the future even as USAID continues to, to work with them and, and build that journey to, to self-reliance uh, so that um, basically we, we, we turn all of those activities over to them eventually. Now, with regards to um, uh, trafficking in persons, we uh, have right now actually a research project with the South African mission. And that is to do a landscape analysis of the, the trafficking in South Africa. Uh, I think the South African government has um, uh, quite a bit of data when it comes to sex trafficking, but this is uh, particular to a labor trafficking um, landscape. And uh, th this you know, highlights one of those situations where um, research is always going to be important to lay the groundwork for how we think about programming moving forward. And uh, certainly sometimes we, we uh, you know, program without taking a step back to reevaluate the situation um, because the situation is always changing and sometimes it's, it's you know, it's hard to stay abreast of, of how things are, are currently uh, moving. Um, in, actually, as was just mentioned by Tina, the, the you know, the, the advent of all of the, the uh, digital um, technology that's being used in, in um, uh, trafficking and um, uh, recruiting um, individuals to trafficking. That's, that's all things, all of that digital technology is, is areas where researchers need to, to find out how it's being used, what those um, resources are, and, and then how we can um, uh, use that information to, to prevent uh, these situations in the future. So uh, that, that has been something that we are working on now. And actually, because of the research, uh, it started in about March, we do have some experience with working in a time of COVID, and that has definitely produced um, some difficulties along the way, uh, mostly with regards to the fact that you can't get out in the field and do in-person surveys and contact people directly, but have to rely on technology. Uh, there, there's challenges that come with that because uh, some of the trafficking victims are sensitive to participating in surveys um, or participating in, in other ways over digital means because that may be the, the, the way that they were actually recruited into trafficking in the first place. So uh, these are all issues that I think are going to require, um, you know, the experts being able to, to uh, have the money and the means to do the work and, and find out what the best way forward is so that um, those of us at USAID and, and other uh, organizations that do want to work in trafficking and, and um, improve that situation and, and solve this problem, understand the best way to go about that. Thank you. 
Thanks, Eric. I'm sorry, Brent. I don't know where that came from. <laughs> sorry, Brent. Um, I think that you make some really, you know, critical points. I really appreciate the fact that you say, you know, funding local researchers is a critical piece of this, that we want to get as close to, you know, sort of that local capacity as we can, and that they're really bringing, you know, insight and passion, but also just really intimate knowledge that we want to be sure that we're leveraging. Um, the research in South Africa and the landscape analysis, it, it's a interesting topic just to raise broadly, you know, whether the perspective of USAID is to really try to fund ground level landscape analyses before sort of enhancing programming. And you also sort of made the point that it needs to be regularized. It's not something that we do sort of once, but we need to be doing periodically. And I think a lot of people are also really struggling with, you know, getting to the field for research, getting to the field for monitoring and evaluation. You know, we all know that we can use technology, but the question of whether it works effectively with you know certain populations and certain you know situations is is obviously a challenge. So I think there's been a lot of sharing throughout the last few days around around that, and I think we need to continue to you know really um, dig into those insights and make sure that everybody's sharing with each other, so we're benefiting from that. Um, I imagine there might be more questions about that South Africa research, so we'll come come back to that. But I will go ahead and turn it to Casey. Thank you, Sarah. I appreciate it. And I appreciate this week's summit. Um, it's really helped me to connect back to um, when I worked as, uh, when one of my roles was working as a um, mental health clinician um, in the family and community trauma space. And then also spending the past 10 years working in academia, training on trauma-informed care for victim survivors and managing research and grant initiatives that worked on program development and evaluation. And so it's it's been really nice to hear the various different roles um, that are kind of helping with CTIP initiatives around the world. Um, but most recently I've, I've come on board with, um, in this DRG center, um, like Mary kind of gave you an introduction to what that is. And, but, but on the CTIP team um, and focused attention on the CTIP team's research projects, um, the, the learning evaluation and, and, and research projects that are going on. And I'm definitely still learning about previous and current research in initiatives and even learning about the good work that Tina, you know, is in, in, in her respective mission is involved in and also Brent and the, um, the, the interface that's going on with South Africa missions. But, um, and I'm probably, it'll probably take a while for me to, to, to learn everything that's going on. But from what I've gathered and, and observed, um, USAID research priorities are focused on really equipping regional missions with an accurate picture of the, the CTIP landscapes um, that, that missions are working within. And, and also really honing in on questions um, and information that can serve the missions well. Um, not just giving answers, but how do we use these that, that can really inform the current work, the, the programs that they have going on, or can inform how they think about, how they design, and how they develop new programs in those regions. Um, I think too, there's a big emphasis for very thoughtful and effective partnerships with research or with regard to research. Um, and, and, and again, and as everybody's talked about on the panel so far, really implementing the victim-centered, the survivor-informed and the trauma-informed approaches, the care and consideration for all programs. Great. So I think um, if I can, Thanks, Jenny. <laughs> sure. Um, I think we were getting a couple of questions. So if I can um, bring it out to the the full panel um, and ask a question now, if that's appropriate. Um, David Dabrowski, hi David, um, is asking um, what research or USAID mission experience has uncovered about systems level change in TIP, um, assuming that the local systems approach is being used in different contexts. Um, he says he gets this sense that measuring results at the systems level is problematic for a number of reasons. 
Um, so what have groups of organizations from different sectors been able to achieve together that they couldn't have done alone? I don't know if Mary or Casey, or um, if you'd like to address that one. So I can, I'll just speak for a little bit and then I'll go ahead and let Casey add on to it. Um, so you know, that's a really, really great question. Um, you know, systems level approach to actually affect, um, you know, larger um, changes is very critical. And so, um, you know, a lot of, you know, just to kind of go back to our, our emphasis with research, um, which is that we want to develop research projects that are based upon um, the needs um, identified um, by the missions, right? And so having said that, um, there's a number of levels in which that can occur, right? As we, as I'd mentioned earlier, there's the just surveying the landscape and assessing what are the issues of regards to trafficking, and then what are the what are the ways in which we can practically address it in a, in programming, right? Um, having said that, though, so in terms of systemic change, you know, there's there's research that we've also done in which we've looked at how various um, in various situations or countries where there might be a lot of political um, military kind of unrest, um, you know, where there's a lot of violence, for example, looking at how some of the trafficking that's occurring there is fueling some of the violence that's occurring there, or, or I should say is funding some of those efforts. So, you know, in that regard, that research, those findings would then be shared with not just, um, you know, disseminated more broadly, but then also with our government partners, um, other implementing partners, um, local folks as well, so that that knowledge can then be used for tailored interventions to address those issues. Um, so, but in terms of grouping organizations, like everyone at different levels from the local levels, um, as we mentioned, like civil society organizations, universities, um, uh, missions, embassies, and governments and whatnot to systematically address trafficking? It's a really good question. I right now cannot think of think of a project that we have done recently that um, you know I can think of how we've done some research in regards to migrants um, and trying to connect all those different agents um, to to effectively address those issues and address um, and provide services for um, for migrant workers and, and and address whatever policy needs there might be as well. Um, but in regards to something that's more systematic that way, I can't, I can't think of one, um, again, in recent years, Casey might know um, something a little bit more in detail about that, but in the recent years, I don't, I don't recall. But yeah, Casey, do you have more knowledge about that? Not, not about recent um, research that's going on, but I know just as far as like kind of large scale, big data research, um, you know, an emphasis on looking at the ecosystem and finding pivotal points of intervention um, in ways where the trafficking in persons cannot thrive. So you're taking kind of the oxygen in essence out of this ecosystem to where it's not going to be, where trafficking in persons can't, and related, um, you know, crimes and problems become, um, you know, it's just not a space where that can happen. And, and there's some really um, kind of cutting edge research that's going on with regard to that. And again, I'm learning more and more about, about that. Um, but that that's what I'm, I, I think that there are some promising approaches, but I also agree, David, that it can be problematic going on such a large scale or going from the systems level too. So there really has to be a lot of cross collaboration and communications going on at many different levels. Mary emphasized the mission level too. And, and with that, I do, I do think, you know, I'd, I really like to tap our missions, um, our, our USAID mission um, speakers as well, um, to see if they have knowledge um, that they can also add to this particular question as well. But it's, it's a very good question. Uh, I will say for the project that's ongoing in, in South Africa, it, it, it's, it's sort of only getting started, so we don't have any data yet. 
but we did organize it in a way that there are parallel studies, one that is looking at the entirety of South Africa and one that's looking specifically at Cape Town. And we involved the Department of Science and Innovation from South Africa and the Department of Justice from South Africa from the beginning. And they are helping, uh, they are sort of working as conduits to plug us in with the, the more local um, uh, government agencies. And so we are hoping that by, by having this sort of very large um, all of South Africa approach and this more localized Cape Town approach that we can. Um, that, that, that will help us uh, to, to understand the, the context dependent sort of what's happening specifically in Cape Town and how that relates to the data that's coming in from all of South Africa. And then it might help us uh, on the back end when um, we, are, we are thinking about programming uh, related to ad addressing whatever the outcomes of, of that is. And getting, the, the government on board and to be part of the study from the beginning. We actually designed the study with uh, the Department of Science and Innovation in South Africa, I think is important uh, because they're not only more involved throughout the, the duration of the research, but uh, uh, they, they, and in this case, they actually uh, co-funded the study. So, so they have a lot more at stake. Um, with the work going forward, and, and they push, uh, they're pushing quite hard to, to bring in other government agencies in order to make sure that at the end of the study, um, the uptake and dissemination um, amongst government partners throughout the country is, is more broad. It's a really helpful sort of insight into that context in South Africa, because I think you, you, you kind of just touched on, you know, four or five different themes that obviously have come out throughout the entire summit. One is just sort of the intersectionality that we're looking at an entire ecosystem and all the different factors at play and how they contribute. Another is just participation and who we're involving at what stage. The earlier that we involve certain you know, agencies, entities, populations, the more buy-in we're building over time. Um, and I think that's you know critical points. I know that we had one question um, in the chat and I know we have about 10 or 12 minutes left. So I'm gonna throw out a couple of different um, questions for you and we can uh, see who's open to responding. We wanted to see if you had specific reflections or takeaways from any of the sessions um, that you were able to attend. We know you probably could only attend a few, but if there are specific takeaways or reflections on that, we'd love to hear it. We also had a question in the chat um, from Ruth that asked about the evolution of USAID CTIP strategy. Um, if that is the Ruth that I think it is, she played a, a role as a senior advisor on CTIP um, early in USAID. And it's a great question. I know there's also you know, new strategy forthcoming. Um, so if there's any reflections on just you know, USAID CTIP strategy over the last 10 years and its evolution, that would be great. So on either of those topics, um, I can see who's ready to start. I won't necessarily go in order. I mean, I'm happy to dive into the second question, um, Sarah. If there's, yes, <laughs> so I know some. We figured you might be right for strategy. Thank you. <laughs> um, I know sometimes it could be like a radio station, right, with a uh, with dead air at times. <laughs> um, anyways, <laughs> so yeah, so but really good question. Um, yeah, so in terms of the, the recent past ten years, now I, you know. Um, you know, I want to preface this with that, you know, I've been working with um, DRG CTIP in, in Washington AID for, um, you know, just since the middle of January of this year, just for everyone's awareness, right? So, um, I mean, so, so I don't I don't know everyone who's been a part of, you know, CTIP for, for the past few years, but um, but in terms of the past few years and, and or several years um, and some of the changes that we're making. So, as we all know, in 2012, um, you know, there was a... Um, there was a publication of the CTIP USA policy. Um, and just right before that, there was also a publication of our code of conduct, um, which is very specific to um, counter trafficking and the responsibilities um, and duties of staff members, as well as all the other people that receive funding from USAID. And so it outlines very clearly what the roles are and the duties in terms of, and also what's prohibited. Um, we do, 
you know, ask people not to engage in commercial sex activities. We ask people not to engage, of course, in trafficking activities. And when we do identify these violations and issues, we also ask people to report it. So again, that's with specifically the code of conduct and, um, you know, we have required training by staff members in regards to that as well. Um, so when we, when we talk about the recent changes over, you know, even the past 10 years, um, you know, I'll bring that kind of to current day, which is that we are actually updating um, or say revising our CTIP policy right now. And it includes very key elements actually that was mentioned throughout this particular evidence summit. And I was really thrilled to hear in a couple of the evidence summits where people brought up particular items. Um, and I'm sure that it was probably a theme throughout the entire evidence summit, but without having attended every single one, I don't wanna misspeak, but um, you know, I'll bring up some specific items. We are adding a key component um, as Casey had also mentioned about victim centeredness survivor-informed and trauma-informed approaches. Um, and you know, using that specific language because it's US government specifically defined language um, that is used when we're dealing with crime, right? So knowing that you know, trafficking is a crime and so we're using that specific kind of language so that there's also consistency throughout the US government efforts. Um, having said that as well, um, you know, one of the themes is, you know, so there's the victim, centeredness um, that would also incorporate the trauma and survivor informed approaches, which also means as bringing in the survivors as agents for change, right? And, and that phrase right there, I actually very specifically heard um, on a call last night um, and this morning actually. And so I think, you know, that, that, right, that is probably one of the key changes also to, or one of the kind of uh, highlighted changes to our revisions to this policy, which is us trying to bring in survivors, trafficking survivors um, into the fold in terms of trying to influence um, hearing their voices in regards to our policies and our programming. Um, we actually had a couple of survivors from the Department of State um, Trafficking Survivor Consultant Network actually review our uh, revisions to our CTIP policy and provide feedback in which case we incorporated most of that feedback already. Um, Again, survivors as agents of change, and not using them as so, not using them as just you know to say that we use survivors and and have that kind of tokenism that occurs, but rather using them in meaningful ways because, quite frankly, they are consultants because they are subject matter experts, right? And so really using that in a way that can really affect programming. Um, and I actually encourage everyone, even as we're looking at research, that we would utilize survivors also in the collaborative process in the brainstorming process as we are thinking of the types of research that we want to do as well as how to use the results the recommendations from the research to incorporate into programming that using the survivors feedback on both fronts would be very important if not also incorporating um, them in the process of actually conducting the research as well as is appropriate um, and so, um, so those, again, some of the key changes with that, as well as also looking again at the ecosystem approach um, with geographically targeted interventions consistent with situational crime prevention. Again, because looking at trafficking and, and taking it through the lens of that it is a crime. Um, and then also looking at um, specifically as it applies to research, um, innovative ways in which we might be able to address, you know, innovative ways in which we might be able to combat trafficking. Um, and that could include, you know, utilizing some of our other internal partners more, um, such as USA Lab, and, and great to see that Brent is on this call. Um, also looking at outside um, labs as well, such as the MIT Lincoln Labs and whatnot. Casey and I were on a call with them, looking at some ways and learning a little bit more about how they're combating trafficking. Um, and then also co-funding research opportunities with the private sector. Um, you know, and looking at ways in which they have motivation to be responsible and ethnic, I mean, ethical um, businesses and how they can also, we can bring them into the fold to be partners with us to, to, to prevent trafficking and, um, and also just, again, finding innovative ways to address that. Um, and with that too, you know, what's also very relevant to the work that we do at USAID as we're talking about this, talking about research, talking about innovation, it's also important that we are, um, not even important, but really critical that we're looking at ways to build capacity for those countries where technology remains a challenge to access, right? As we know, there's there's places like the Philippines where, where we are seeing um, such a high number of, of children that are that are being exploited in, um, you know, in child sexual, in, in, in material child sexual abuse activities with online 
um, exploitation. And so, but again, you know, are there ways in which we can also help build capacity in those countries where technology remains a challenge, right? So, um, and part of my role with all of this, you know, I'm in a very, um, you know, privileged role where, um, and a challenging role in which I will, my role is to advocate um, for opportunities, for funds and whatnot to help, um, to help with research and to help with other programming and whatnot um, at both the Washington level with our various interagencies and those kind of opportunities for partnerships, but also within our own leadership um, to see how we might be able to prioritize certain areas um, and also develop partnerships um, with key um, with key stakeholders as well. So, um, so anyway, so going back to, yeah, so very key revisions that were that are occurring at USAID um, with highlighting survivors as that key element for these changes, um, as well as, um, again, just looking at ways we can we can better incorporate um, research as well as um, the voices of the local community. Over. I did want to jump in here and ask a question um, to build on that. Um, when you're talking about building the capacity, um, you know, in many ways, um, I noticed that Brent also talked about building the capacity and working with local researchers. Um, and I think that's an important point. You know, we're sometimes thinking about research as international groups, universities coming in and doing research and then kind of jumping out. Um, and so one of the things that we focus on at Winrock is trying to build the capacity of mid-level and junior level researchers. And so I was curious, actually, Brent, if you wanted to talk a little bit more about how you're doing that in your research efforts and whether that's something, is that a component of the South Africa research or other things that you're doing right now? Can I, I'm sorry, can you just repeat the, the question? Sure. Um, the question is how you're using, so you mentioned um, the importance of bringing in local researchers as a connection um, to, you know, the, building the journey to self-reliance, and that's something we're also focused on, um, and so I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about how you're doing that um, and how that's, you know, again, building the capacity of, of local communities to um, inform and, and provide, you know, information out to the, the world, not just having kind of an international um, groups coming in and, and doing the research themselves. Sure. Uh, yeah. So, so the, the programs that we run are set up in a way that uh, pretty much all of the projects that we start uh, require a local researcher. So uh, for this, this uh, uh, CTIP pro project in, in South Africa, we have a number of South African researchers, but also a number of uh, U.S. researchers that are involved in this, and uh, it's it's really designed in a way that the the local researchers um, in the developing countries can can utilize the expertise and the resources of the U.S. researchers as well. So I think that part of building that capacity, what's what's important is um, first of all uh, giving them the means. Uh, so so you know by providing funding directly to them, it allows them to purchase equipment, um, fund students uh, to do the work, uh, attend meetings. Um, also, it's important if you can uh, provide the means for US researchers that may uh, be experts or have more experience in the area to fly into country and to help them uh, set stuff up and, and to organize research. And so that is really, uh, been useful because it's actually helped uh, local researchers to build lab capacity. Maybe they needed uh, a piece of equipment that may not be relevant to this work, or, or maybe we bought them a bunch of, of cell phones or computers or whatever it might be that they are then able to use as, as they move forward in their work. And many times they're actually able to turn uh, that into, uh, to, to sort of build a, a, a lab that then becomes noticed by the, the regional community so that other scientists want to collaborate more and come in and, and use that equipment or they maybe they uh, saw them at a meeting or, or, or read a, a paper that they wrote and something that they wouldn't have otherwise been able to do without uh, that funding opportunity that we provide to them. So that's a little bit different in, in many ways than uh, funding sort of the traditional implementers to, to go in and do the work um, because oftentimes the, the researchers aren't getting those funds or if they do bring a researcher on, maybe they just bring on the um, principal investigator almost in a consultative role, but you don't necessarily um, drag in five, six students uh, as, as bachelor's, master's, PhD students to, to help in that work. 
And you know that has knock on effects because those students might actually uh, get their PhD um, completely funded from a three or four year project and then go on to start their, their own laboratory uh, at a, a university also in the country. So you know that, that's sort of what we're hoping to do. Um, not only do you build researcher capacity, but you can also build that institutional capacity, like I said, by bringing resources into the university that then um, uh, are, are, are attractive to, maybe, maybe other researchers in the university can use those, maybe it actually um, attracts people from other universities to come over because they, they can utilize that as well. Thanks, Brent. I think that's really um, incredibly informative. I mean, that that is the direction that we wanna take and that is how we build out that local capacity. Um, and really sustain it, creating the opportunity and the actual backing and funding to be able to drive that forward. I know we are unfortunately out of time and we're just a minute over. Um, we had more questions and more questions in the chat, so I appreciate everybody's participation. Um, but I wanted to just uh, end on the note of, you know, uh, thanking all of you for participating and really being appreciative of the evolution, I'm sorry, of, uh, evolution of USAID's strategy, you know, hearing the focus on survivors is, you know, what we sort of all want all the time. It's not just about being survivor informed, it's survivor led, it's survivor designed, it's survivors at the helm and participating in research. And it really is sort of a critical and, and central focus. So um, it's great to see that evolution. I wanted to let people know that um, there will be a survey coming out. We really value your um, input into all of this and Hermes can tell you a bit more about that. And also just to remind people that the pitch competition, the initial two page concept um, is due by the end of the month. So if you have any questions, you can reach out to us. But um, I wish that we had more time, deeply appreciative of everybody's willingness to engage and the fantastic questions in the chat. And we can keep answering a few of those questions in the chat as well. But thank you so much for your time. Thanks very much for having us. Thank you so much, everyone, for attending the USAID Asia Counter Trafficking in Persons Evidence Summit from Evidence to Action, hosted by Winrock International. You have our sincere gratitude from everyone at the USAID Asia CSIP team to all participants, speakers, moderators, and hosts for your enthusiasm, participation, and critical discussion. The sessions at the summit would not have been the same without your perspectives and experiences. We highly, highly encourage you to keep the conversations going and the MS Team Summit community will remain open through the end of the month to help you facilitate conversations for the grant competition. I've already been hearing really great reports so far from CSOs and small social enterprises who have started to connect with each other on the MS Team's community. So just put your name out there and see where you can begin a conversation and that might spark into something more. The grant competition is being offered to you through your participation in the summit so that you can build these new partnerships and put evidence to action. Again, thank you everyone so much for your participation. Please stay healthy and happy and enjoy your day wherever you are in the world. Thank you so much.